September, I write little uh, uh, booklets and um, uh, about five uh, booklets per summer. It's my summer hobby. Uh, there in the background, you see a fake photograph uh, of the real uh, uh, view from my summer cabin on the Oslo Fjord. So uh, that is a, a ship going to Denmark and uh, it could go to Lithuania, I suppose, and uh, our, my lighthouse. But I'm not there now. I'm actually at my home nearby in near Oslo. Um, so <clears throat> let's see. Um, so during the summer, uh, for, for me, I take a long summer, uh, you know, sort of uh, July, August, uh, September, uh, this year even more for uh, quarantine reasons. Uh, I wrote uh, six books. Well, one of them is only a little booklet of 13 pages, but some of them are 250, 300 pages. Uh, during, um, so, but I decided that one of the books would be one I found a funny title. I, I love to find crazy new words. Just, I almost say if I find a crazy enough word, I'll write a book about it. So uh, uh, at first I, I thought uh, quant quantering. Uh, you see the detailed text on the left hand side here, Quantus, how great, how much. So that's our theme, that's quantifying. And then ear, it means like engineer, it means a person. Uh, who, so this is a quantier is a new word. It's a person who quantifies and quantiering is the act of quantifying. And I'm quite a fanatic on quantifying. Uh, it was 1976. I published the book Danius mentioned uh, software metrics, where I also described agile in some nice detail. So uh, I wrote a book really especially for you guys. <laughs> Uh, that was the purpose. I, uh, of course, we'll share it with other other people. Um, now, let's see. Uh, the, yeah, the book itself. Uh, it, it, the link is on the left if you want the book itself. But if uh, the book and the slides are pretty much the same, so you can take your choice. I have to warn you about something. Uh, the warning is already on the first slide. I'm not one of these guys who has a pretty picture with three words on a slide. Uh, I don't believe in that. I mean, it's nice. And um, sometimes every other slide, I put in a nice slide with little picture and little text. But my style is I like to put a lot of information in uh, every slide. Now that means we are not going to go through every word on every slide. Uh, but it does mean when you review the slides later, because you want to understand it better, I'm not there, but the text is there. And I also believe that uh, detailed slides allow me to show realistic case study detail. I'm a great believer in the real thing, not nice theories and waving your hands. So that's another reason I have very detailed slides. So forgive me my bad habit. Everybody tells me it's a bad habit and I shouldn't do it, but I'm too old to change you are going to get some detailed slides. If you don't like it, it's really easy. Close your eyes and listen. How's that? Okay. Now, uh, we are going to focus on two kinds of quantification for IT systems. And uh, you're all, I'm sure, in the IT business. But in fact, my methods are systems methods. That means they work on any system like organizing people or building an airplane or uh, um, I, I wrote a book uh, last year on uh, United Nations uh, 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 sustainability goals. In other words, end poverty and help education. And so, uh, so my methods are actually designed to work on anything. Now, even for IT people, that's good news because your IT systems are going into an environment with people and organizations and products and hardware and database and not just software and programs. So it doesn't hurt that the methods I have will work in your real environment, even though you may be at heart a programmer writing code. Uh, one day maybe you will want to uh, take a bigger share of the action there. Now, this little diagram here is using some uh, icons I've developed. 
uh, let's start with a simple one. Uh, function, that's just a simple circle, that is defined as what the system does. You know, it, uh, it uh, steers an airplane or writes invoices. Uh, this arrow is symbolic of uh, the most important thing the whole day for me. It's what I call a value. And uh, many of those values are qualities like security. So here at this end of the arrow is very bad security. Uh, here is actually the security we have right now. It's okay. Here is the perfect security nobody can get. And here is the value goal. That's the security level we want. Maybe we want to go from 45% of uh, catching a hacker within five seconds, which is here. And we want to get to 95% uh, uh, percent probability of catching a hacker here. So this is our security goal. If you like, this is a requirement. It is a value requirement. And it's also a subset of values known as qualities. It's an illity like security, a security requirement. So this is a scale of measure, just like speed, car stopping, car at top speed, car at very high speed, uh, kilometers per hour. Um, my theory uh, is that absolutely all stakeholder values that you can put words like improved, enhanced, etc. All of them can be quantified, no exceptions. And this means we can manage them uh, through the numbers. We can put a goal to clarify exactly how good we want to be, requirement, and we can measure uh, the designs or architecture, how good are they in helping us get to our goal. And when we implement our designs or architecture, we can measure how good we are incrementally becoming. This is the essence of Agile, is the incrementally getting better and better and better, not just in functionality or use, user stories, but in this case, how good we are getting in the values, in the security, the usability, the technical debt, and uh, other qualities of the system. So. My lecture today is about these things. First, how do you quantify? Uh, for me, it means design a scale of measure. We'll spend plenty of time on that today. How do you quantify any value or goal? How do you put a number on, on your requirement? That's this little point here. Uh, how do you estimate how good a design is in moving you towards your goal? You want designs enough designs that you get to your goal? And how do you measure how good the design is in practice when you increment, maybe you increment uh, this in three increments and the design gives you this much and then this much and then this much, and then you need a new design. You have a gap there where this design does not give it to you. So that in uh, a drawing and in a few, few words is the whole um, idea of the uh, method and lectures. Wasn't that simple? We're all done. You can go home, go back to sleep, whatever you like. Okay, now, let's see. Ah, pushing, there we go. And just checking, okay, yeah. Um, let's see, here are some uh, 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 hashtags you might like to note. You're very welcome to uh, Twitter and put things on LinkedIn and we will have a video of this we'll share later. And here again are the slides for today. In uh, PDF, if somebody says, I would love to have your slides in uh, PowerPoint or something like that, uh, let me know, I'll, I'll put them out in PowerPoint. You're very welcome to uh, borrow my slides and use them in your own presentations for teaching or whatever. Uh, let's see, that's enough of that. Yeah, it does say uh, this is interactive. So uh, I, at least at the beginning, I'm going to try some interaction. Uh, and uh, it also says for experienced agile practitioners. Uh, what I'm teaching is really quite advanced and requires that you have experience. You didn't just learn agile 
and you're struggling to learn it, that it, probably this would be too much. You really have to be mature enough to know that you have a problem with the qualities and values and delivering them. And if you don't know that you have a problem, Google something like um, agile IT system failures, and you'll find that something like 20 to 50% of all IT projects are total failure. And uh, uh, um, uh, about 95% are either total failure or challenged. In other words, late, over budget. So we have a very uh, bad uh, set of methods, obviously, since we fail so often. And uh, I'm, I'm trying to solve that problem and give you tools to solve that problem. I'd like to think that if you do what I'm teaching you, you will, you will succeed on your projects every time gloriously, okay? Wouldn't you like to be the exception that normally succeeds? So uh, that gives you pride in your work and, and joy and maybe a good job. Okay, so I hope you're experienced enough to appreciate it. If not, well, look at the slides in two years when you're tired of having problems and failing and say, Tom claimed I could do better. Maybe I'll study this stuff now. And even this video lecture will probably be available then too. So um, now quantifying quality, uh, agile. If you go to normal uh, agile, uh, you will find very little about quantifying anything except the time to deliver the project and maybe the, the frequency of the, the sprints and uh, uh, maybe some burn down charts for costs uh, maybe the size of an epic or story, uh, but in particular, normal agile as taught does not mention qualities like security, usability, maintainability. They certainly doesn't use the word engineering. In the old days, we used to call all programmers software engineers. Now they're called developers. Uh, I believe very strongly that for the larger projects, uh, like uh, building a government system for health, to take an example, uh, we need to have an engineering idea, not just a craftsman idea. A craftsman idea, a soft crafter is a programmer. And programmers, uh, uh, plumbers and, and um, carpenters cannot build skyscrapers of 200 stories. You need engineers and architects. So uh, uh, and my methods are for dealing with uh, large scale systems where life is at stake, like a medical system for a country or um, uh, an air traffic control system or something large, okay? Uh, you can use my methods on smaller systems, but they are not so necessary for survival. Now, uh, so what has quantifying quality got to do with agile? Uh, I believe that the, and you can observe this yourself, the primary reason that anybody does any project is that they have some, what I call stakeholder, that's your customers and users and more, value objectives. Uh, and uh, it means they have some values like we need to make the system more secure. We need to make the system more user friendly. We need to make the system more flexible and easy to maintain. These are our values. Uh, in the United Nations uh, planning, the value is end poverty, uh, increase education, uh, protect people from hurricanes and, and things like that. Those are human values. So value is anything that the stakeholders value, absolutely anything, it's their choice. But the projects we do, if you go deeply, it's not, with, they're not there to write code or to do user stories or to build functionality. They're there to satisfy the stakeholder value. That's why somebody is paid. Now, if, if you uh, don't ask them about their values, you won't find out and you won't deliver them. And you will have, by definition, a failed project. Project failure is when you do not deliver the values on time. Okay, so uh, in um, last uh, uh, summer, I, I wrote these five booklets and one of them was called Value Agile. 
So I go into some depth on how agile and these values hang together, the quantification. And again, uh, free copy, uh, even slides and video and book and the whole thing. Uh, so if you want to go deeper into now, but, but this value agile, this is primarily two thirds of the book is actually a criticism of the value, the agile manifesto and a suggestion for how to rewrite the manifesto so that it is more focused on the values of the system rather than the user stories and things like that. So if you're looking for a mature criticism of Agile by grandfather of Agile, it's in the book in detail. Okay, enough of that. Uh, here is our uh, new book, which is uh, not discussing Agile so much as it is focusing on how do we quantify? Because a lot of people say, well, I would love to quantify security, but how do you do it? I would love to quantify user friendliness, but how do you do it? And uh, so, uh, and in fact, quite advanced, well-educated, mature people are still asking me that question. Uh, I would like to quantify, but I don't believe it's possible. This is soft, it's difficult, it's impossible. And I've been hearing this for, for 50, 60 years. You know what? It's not true. Every value can easily be quantified. And I'll give you a lot of information about that here and now. No except You just have to know how. It's that simple. So uh, here we have a, a, an exercise. I got an extra half an hour. And uh, we, can, we don't have to turn slides. We can play a little bit. Um, so here's an exercise for you, and uh, uh, I'm hoping I can uh, open it up somehow for getting some voices back to me. I don't think I've turned off all the... Uh, Danius, can you hear me and can you talk on the microphone? Yes, I will uh, allow participants to unmute so they... Good. Uh, we'll have good. So we can to... unmute everybody, I guess, or everybody who wants to be. And uh, you can, uh, but I'm going to give you a 15 minute uh, uh, job, as it were. Just a moment, get my own timer sort of running on this uh, exercise. There we go, reset, and start. Okay, now, first, I'd like you to think of a quality, for example, um, security, privacy, user friendliness. Uh, it could be availability, reliability, maintainability, the traditional engineering qualities. I'd like you to think of a quality that is highly valued by your users and stakeholders for a project you're working on now or, or have worked on before. I give some examples there. Usability, transparency, digitization, privacy, security, agility. That covers a lot of popular buzzwords, but you can think of any quality you want and sort of maybe get yourself a piece of paper, but you can do this in your mind or on your computer. Write down the name of that quality. And you can write down the name of a quality you think is important, but you do not know how to quantify it yet. You'd like to find out. <laughs> okay. So, uh, has everybody thought of a buzzword now? I hope so. Is there anybody who says, I don't have time yet, give me three more minutes? <laughs> I can't hear anybody. <laughs> Danius, can we hear anybody if they want to talk? Uh, yes, they can unmute and say if they want, okay. if they are not shy. Okay. Well, uh, Danis, we'll, we'll, we'll use you. I know I can hear you. Have you, Danis, thought of equality? Yeah, I thought. Um, okay, and which one is it? I would say security. Security. Okay, very good choice, as the waiter says when you choose the most expensive wine. <laughs> okay. Now, can you quantify security for a real IT project? Do you know how? I'm hoping you'll say no. <laughs> uh, 
I'm not sure if I, I not sure. Okay. Yeah. I'll ask another question. Have you ever qu uh, quantified security before, or have you seen anybody who has done it on a project? Quantified security. Mm, maybe not much or, no. or not. <laughs> No, 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 no. I mean, it is uh, completely, I would expect almost everybody to say no, not done. Uh, because uh, certainly not in Scrum or any known variation of Agile, there is no teaching to do it or how to do it. That's what I'm going to supply you with, right? Okay. So, uh, so let, let's assume that most people chose something that they have not quantified themselves. Their project has not quantified and they are not sure of how to do it, okay? And you're all smart, educated people. Uh, some of you, I hope, have uh, engineering or science uh, degrees, and you know a lot about other kinds of quantification, but maybe you didn't learn security or digitization or transparency. So, okay, now, um, uh, okay. Now, um, let's see. Uh, here, I'm going to get out of this and daringly go into a uh, tool. Let's see. Can I get into Keynote? Right. Okay. And um, okay, I think I won't do that so daringly. I just go into a uh, blank piece of paper. And oh, while you're doing some, some, I will maybe, I would like to check uh, if everyone can unmute. Yes, do, do check that. Uh, Daniel, can you try to unmute? Can you unmute? No? Because I unmuted. Hmm. Okay. Okay. And um, I unmuted everyone. So you could try, I think, or unmute, unmute. So yeah okay yeah anybody can join in at this uh uh point now okay. it's available can... hello okay hello. yes i hear you okay so uh, uh so security okay now uh, uh maybe make this uh, bigger and can you see my screen where i have written security just testing is that okay Can anybody see my screen where it is security? No, I'm not getting any. No, we see just that slide screen now. You see just the slide. You can't actually see my screen. Of, of I have a, some notes where I'm writing security. Uh, so how can I show? That's surprising. You, you can see my slides, right? Mm -hmm. but you cannot see what I'm writing. That's strange. I thought you could just see anything on my screen, but apparently not. Possibly uh, share just uh, uh, that yeah. program. Now, uh, I'll tell you, I, I, I'm going to try, try a tactic here. I'm going to, uh, oh, mute, uh, I'm going to put in a, a uh, but you can see this, right? Yeah. Ah, okay. I can use this to write on. Okay. So uh, I'll, I'll use this to make notes. It'll throw my slides off by a little bit, but okay. So you can see that I'm writing security, correct? Yes. And uh, maybe I don't have, to. okay. So uh, I, I'm, I'm going to just do it in a simple way. So the first thing I do is I give it a name and I can write security. And that is my tag, that is my name tag. It's very important that you give a name to um, things so you can re re reference them later, okay? Now, I'm gonna write down ambition. This is a process I use to define things. And so I have a thing called ambition level. And less politely, when it comes from managers, I tease them a little bit, I call it the bullshit level. Uh, so, okay, so uh, really uh, great IT, security against uh, hackers and ransomers. Uh, okay. You can see this, just checking. 
Uh, somebody has to. Yes. You, okay, good. Okay. Okay, so what I'd like you to do, you can do it in your mind, you can do it on paper, is uh, with your, uh, the value you were thinking about, write ambition level, or often, usually we abbreviate it just to ambition, and then write down a sentence of the uh, quality level. In other words, write down, ambition level means write how much you want for whom. So I wrote, I want really great, that's how much, for whom? For IT security against hackers and ransomers. That's for whom. So this is, so th uh, this is the level you will get out of any managers or analysts who are capturing, it's pretty close to user stories. Okay. And uh, in fact, sometimes we literally write the user story there. So I can show you that user uh, story. Okay. And uh, we would write something uh, uh, like uh, uh, I, as uh, security uh, director, want uh, really uh, great security because we just uh, paid ransom. Okay, <laughs> okay so th that then is the user story format, which is... Uh, uh, who is responsible for it? Very good. And uh, what do they want? Really great security. And why the justification? Uh, because we just paid for it. Okay. So this is uh, essentially um, a user story. Whether you call it user story or uh, um, ambition level doesn't really uh, matter. Leave it there. Okay, but now it turns out uh, most people stop there, especially in Agile, they stop with user stories. My good friend, Mike Cohn, who's Mr. User Story, uh, who also visited me at this summer cabin, by the way, uh, in Norway, uh, he um, uh, was asked on, on a blog a few years ago, what if we want to do qualities in user stories? And he replied, then you should use Gilb's methods. And uh, uh, so, uh, in, in fact, I invited him to work with me doing qualities in user stories. And he basically said, I don't have time for that. You do it. So, so I, 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 I am doing it. But uh, the, he acknowledges that qualities are not really, quantified qualities are not really in user stories yet. You have to plug them in yourself. Now. So step one was this fellow here, the, the name of the thing we're doing so we can refer to it. The step two was this uh, user story or ambition level, let's call it user story since this is agile. And then finally, uh, we, we get to some of the, the dramatic change, the new thing, the thing I would add. I write the word scale, which is short for scale of measure. So what is the scale of measure for speed of a car, an automobile? Okay, kilometers per hour. What is the uh, uh, speed of uh, data on the internet? Okay, uh, you know, uh, megabits per second, right? So you all know what a scale is and you know lots of scales. But now we need a scale for security. And that is the essence of, the, of quantifying, that you, you define security in terms of a scale. And that's where people have a problem. They don't know how to define a scale of measure. Uh, and they're not taught a scale of measure. You were not taught, here is a scale of measure for security. Okay, I'm gonna point you to a free book of mine later called Competitive Engineering, and you will find scales of measure for security in the book and for usability and for maintainability. We'll see that shortly. But now I'm gonna make up a scale of measure. Uh, and uh, let's see, uh, let's, let me just try something. Uh, percentage of hackers caught. Okay, well, that sounds good. So I've now defined security in terms of how many hackers I caught. Do I catch 100% of hackers or 0% of hackers? Or So I have a scale of measure. And this is simple, I'm not saying it's the best scale of measure, it is not. I'm not saying it's the only scale of measure for security, it is not, but it is proof that there is a scale of measure for security, 
which is reasonable and can uh, communicate better than these words, you know, uh, which the uh, problem with the words is there are, uh, for example, really great. How big is that? Security. What is it? Is it against hackers or some other type of security? See, there are all kinds of uh, problems here with the words. Now, let me uh, ask a simple question. Uh, we'll call it the past level for 2020 for uh, our IT system. And if I were to ask you, um, Adenius, to estimate how good is the probability you will catch any hacker? And I'm going to put a number in here just to give you some. Uh, I put down 50%. means you believe the current system will capture 50%. Uh, do you have a number in mind like somewhere between 0 and 100, Danius? Uh, maybe it would be 70%. Uh, uh, 7 zero. Yes. Okay. Let's put seven zero. Okay. And, and I'm going to put a little uh, sign here. This is a little, uh, I call it a key icon, but it means source. And uh, D-A-N-I-U-S. Am I missing a letter? Did I get that right? Uh, one I before, uh, after A. Ah, D yeah, D right. Oh, okay, right. Okay. You told me. Dan was the abbreviation, and I got stuck in that. Okay. Oh, so this means uh, somebody called uh, Adenius estimated 70% on this scale of measure. In other words, the 70% is directly referring to this one. So I'm teaching you the, the basic structure of what we do here. Now, Adenius, uh, I'm going to now write a very simple uh, idea, a goal for maybe next uh, year. Uh, for 2021, right? And would you like to get the same or better or worse? Definitely okay. better. Okay, give me the number for your goal. Let's reach 80. 80, okay. Uh, right, now uh, just to show a little uh, detail here, uh, let's look at a long-term goal, let's say four or five years from now, and we put another number in there. What would you like by 2025? At least 95. There we go. And we can even write, you know, in, uh, uh, at, at least or something like that, that way. Uh -huh. Okay. And then we can also say, but wait a minute. Danius told us how bad it was, but uh, that's not necessarily the same person who told us how good it should be, but it was in this case. So I'm going to credit you. I'm a fanatic on crediting sources. And the reason is, let's call it traceability, quality control, and reviewability. At some point in the future, I can go back and say, Danius, did you say 70%? And they might say, no, I said 17, and Tom misunderstood me. You see? <laughs> did you say 95% by 2025? Yes, I did, but I've changed my mind. We have to have 99.5. Okay, so it's very important idea when you capture numbers to capture the source for all kinds of reasons, and I gave you a few. Okay, now I have now in simple terms quantified security. Do you see my point? And the basic idea is I, I, I read my user story idea, but I say that's not good enough because I haven't defined what security is. Uh, the moment we said hackers caught, we have, in fact, defined security. Uh, I, I haven't uh, decided how to put numbers on it, but the moment I say percentage hackers caught, then I can, these numbers have meaning, okay? Uh, I could have just said hackers caught, and that would be the number of hackers caught, you know, 70 or uh, not percentage, but I've decided on percentage, okay? Percentage would start. Now, I'm gonna go one step further. I'm going to, um, uh, put hackers and caught in square brackets. And these are called uh, 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 scale parameters. I'll write down the word. We're going to learn more about it, uh, but it's quite powerful uh, idea. Okay. Uh, so, uh, and what I'm going to do here is say um, uh, 70%. And then I'm going to say hackers and um, 
uh, I'm going to put uh, uh, Russian professionals. I thought you Lithuanians would would respond to that, right? And uh, I'm a comma and uh, caught uh, uh, K C A U G H T. Um, uh, uh, identified and stopped. I was going to put put in jail or something like that, but that sounds too drastic. Okay, uh, stopped. Okay. So what I've done here is I've said there can be many types of hackers: amateurs, professionals, nationals, thieves, and there can be many concepts of caught. What does caught mean? See, I mean, if you really capture a hacker, you, you grab them physically, put them in jail, and stop them forever, then you really caught them. But sometimes we're just happy if we can stop them, even though we don't know where they are. Sometimes we're just happy if we can identify them and tell them, please stop it or we'll put you in jail. Okay? So the word caught has many possible practical meanings, and the word hackers has many possible meanings. And uh, my, by putting these uh, scale parameters uh, in the scale, I can now model. This is the word. This is a modeling technique. I can now model my security in a more advanced or rich ways. I can model all the types of hackers I'm interested in. I can model all the types of caught. So let's take a little example. Um, if I uh, take... This was just a, a general uh, goal, but if I uh, uh, it, it take, um, uh, let's see, hackers, and I put uh, internal, in other words, uh, own employees, and then I take caught, uh, and we'll put uh, in the act documented, it's a different kind of catching, but Caught you with your pants down, okay? Uh, so now I have a completely different dimension. I don't have some Russian professionals. Uh, I, I, I don't have, I have identified and stopped them, but I caught them in the act. I have evidence that they, as an employee, uh, have hacked, okay? So I can now model as many, let's say I have 10 different kinds of hackers and 10 different kinds of catching people. I can model all combinations of these that I'm interested in. In other words, I can model a complex real world better. Uh, now, what, what's this got to do with agile is a question worth getting back to. This is a tactic for um, uh, decomposing into um, uh, sprints. So if my primary interest and priority is to, uh, to catch uh, uh, Russian professionals and stop them, I, I, I put, uh, I, I can say uh, that my, my goal, well, let's see, let's, uh, I'll change the goal here. Let's call it uh, sprint one. See? I've now decided that on sprint one, I'm going to focus on internal hackers caught in the act. Okay? And obviously, I can continue this with sprint two, sprint three, sprint four. And what I can do is select those things that are most urgent, most prioritized, maybe only 1% of the effort, but maybe 80% of what I care about. And I can get very high value in the short term by using Agile to deliver high value combinations early. You see how this, this is an advanced technique for decomposing into sprints. Okay, let's just leave that there. I think when I save my next copy, I will save this, but if you want to copy this, you take a, um, a, 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 a photo of it. Let's see. Um, uh, well, before I go on, does anybody have any questions about what we did? And do you think you could, if you didn't already, try to do something like it? I'm listening. So we definitely do these kind of things. Um, the question is, uh, well, 
it seems to me like very much related to how to measure anything. A great book on a very similar topic, uh, quite not a new one. <laughs> so yeah. Is this something very similar, right? I mean, yes. Uh, if you look at Mr. Hubbard's book, you'll find him. He refers to Tom Gilbin, the book. <laughs> And okay. you will also find out that uh, he has actually invited me to write a new book with him. So we are still talking about that. Now, this is much more advanced than you will find in his book. Okay. You will not find uh, 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 these uh, ideas of, for example, parameters in a scale. And you will also not find in IT practice people doing very much of this many places. Mostly they learn nothing and they do nothing. Okay. But hang on, uh, uh, if, uh, uh, give me my full two hours and uh, uh, you will see quite a lot of new stuff that is not in any other book you've ever read except my own. And, uh, but you can judge what is new. But if you are already practicing this, I challenge you to send me a copy of what you say you practice so I can say, I agree, you do it. Now here, Tom at Gilb dot com you are all welcome to show me that you really do something here if you claim you do because i know from experience that you do not maybe you think you do but we'll see you can just send it to me and i will comment on it okay is that have i replied to you uh, sort of i claim this is essentially new methods with essentially new practice for you but there can be exceptions who really practice something like this, and I'd like to get to meet you and see where you learned your stuff from. Um, hi, yeah. uh, Demanta here. I think I'm doing kind of this stuff, and uh, the management in meetings, they started to dislike me uh, to some point, and I always thought uh, that it's maybe my character or maybe I'm, you know, pushing them to get me precise numbers instead of uh, those uh, fancy words. But I have met you in uh, in Tescon uh, and read some of your books. So maybe I, without knowing it, was following your advices. So that <laughs> makes me feel better. Good. A little bit. Makes me feel good too. That's good. So yeah, of course, I've been to whole lectures in Vilnius and other places. Yeah, so you can think about it. And I'd really appreciate it if you uh, wrote me an email and told me a little bit about your thinking there. And I will reply to everybody, and uh, you can even ask questions uh, and give examples. Yeah, good. Um, uh, let, let's see. We, uh, so, are there any questions about what we the exercise here? Uh, uh, I mean, if you tried to write a scale of measure, did you get some kind of scale of measure? And if you tried to write a number on the scale of measure, did it make any sense? Those are the essential questions here. Uh, hi, Tom. Uh, I have a question about uh, is, if this relates or is this uh, very different from OKR framework, if you're aware of that? Yes, I am. Uh, now, uh, it is, uh, it's a vague cousin like between a monkey and a human being. But I'll tell you what I'm going to do for you. Now, by the way, at the very end of these slides, you will find a lot of references to a lot of... Uh, papers, but, uh, and so I think the OKR paper I have is there, and uh, my value requirements uh, book is there, uh, but I'm going to paste in my uh, paper on OKR. Uh, okay, so, so direct answer to your question is that link. Okay, guild.com DL 879. Uh, uh, and uh, you will also find that in the value requirements book, which is a free download, you'll find it at the back of the slides. Uh, I have commented on many similar methods, not just OKR, but I've commented on OKR, okay? Uh, OKR and more. So now, now that's, those are my short answers. I have uh, analyzed them. I've uh, uh, written my, now basically I have a criticism of them. Uh, I think they are not as good as they could be, but I'll, I'll give you this, they're better than nothing. They're at least trying to quantify it. And my criticism is they're not very good at it in my opinion, and I have some reasons for that. 
Okay. Okay. So, thank you. Yeah. So, so you can read this and you can come back to me and say, okay, Tom, I read your paper on OKR, but I believe you're wrong or uh, whatever. You, you can, yeah. But, but uh, so I, but I have a very, uh, I, I would not suggest to any of my clients that they practice it, put it that way. I think we have better things to do and they're in this lecture and in this book. Okay, but if you think there's something uh, uh, better to do, uh, tell me, I'm willing to learn. Uh, by the way, when you uh, talk, it'd be very nice if you at least gave your first name. So who was the one who asked the OKR question? This was Ordas. Sorry, I'm not introducing you. <laughs> Say it slowly. Oh. It's A-U-R-I-D-A-S. Okay, I-A-D... A-U-R-I-D-A-S. The A-S, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's nice yeah. to just so get a the, name. And... Yeah, the second day is uh, not needed. Okay, second day is not needed. You mean the uh, the second day? Yeah. Ah, that's that second. Yeah, this one, day. yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How do you do? Or just, uh, have we I'm met before? Uh, no, I don't think so. <laughs> okay, welcome. But so you're you're the guy who asked the OKR question, and this is nicely documented now, so that's fine. So get get back to me. Uh, I, I believe uh, now. By the way, if you want something simple. Um, uh, your, uh, then OKR will be okay for you. Uh, actually, I, I, I'll tell you how I view OKR. It's a tactic to help individuals plan their work a little bit better. And I don't have a problem with it there. Uh, it is, uh, my criticism it is it is not a good tactic for planning a system like the National Health System of Lithuania. You see the difference? So it's, it's a quantification of multiple things and it doesn't have to be so sophisticated because it's not life and death. It's just my work next week, okay? So if you'd like, my criticism is fine, but not good enough for serious systems. Only good enough for helping an individual to think better about their daily work, which is what it's designed for and what it's used for. But it is a quantification of value methods. Okay. okay. Other questions? Tom, just a, <clears throat> just a question here from, from Angelo. Okay. I'm, I'm coming from a project management background and I heard about this uh, through some workshops from Gosko Adzik, where he talks about oh, yeah. those measurements in, in this impact mapping tool. Yep, um, yep. And then I, I have the feeling that those measurements of because this looks like outcomes to me you know it's the result of a project which is small or, or, or big no matter the, the the answer there but it looks like to me that those measurements are something that um, that is usually talked through the program management level in standard you know governance of projects that's how i feel it it's like for me in agile projects, we talk about those outcomes in the project is itself because because we need to deliver those elements at shorter term, right? But normally, is it something that we those measurement that we put at the program level in standard? Uh, the simple answer is yes. You are right. Okay. And uh, you'll notice in the impact mapping book, uh, he refers to my methods, and he. Uh, mm -hmm offers a simplified version of my impact estimation table. Mm -hmm. And he and I are very good friends. We spend a lot of time talking with each other. But uh, he, so he, he is good at making, let's say, simplified versions of my methods. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, that's good. And, uh, but I, 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 the simplified versions won't be good enough for really large complex projects. They're too simple. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I have respect for what he does. He's a good, good man and he, he does good stuff. But uh, the problem, a lot of people don't want to learn the heavy, um, uh, heavy duty, large scale <laughs> things. They want to learn something simple, but unfortunately sometimes they use the simple things on big complex projects which fail. So the national health system kills a thousand people a month because it's a bad IT system. 
You say we, so you have to have okay. good enough methods. But for I see that's that's the reason why I came here, just globally to understand a little bit more about these things in more details. And it's it's kind of initiating me to these topics uh, right now, so it's uh, it's interesting. Okay, good. good. Thanks. Yeah, there are very many levels of these things, and some are for simpler purposes, like OKR for planning a, a person's work, and some are necessary for the many large failed systems. You see the. If you look at the um, failure rates of systems, what they found is the very large systems have the highest failure rates. And the very large systems are like very large government and corporate systems. And there are plenty of them, and we're, we don't have good enough tools to manage them. And I'm saying things like uh, the impact mapping and OKR are not heavy duty enough tools for the large complex systems, but they may be quite good for a smaller system, okay? Let me define a smaller system. Three programmers working for 10 weeks, small system. Let me define large system. Uh, hundreds of people worldwide building an international uh, system for eight years, <laughs> okay? And even in little Norway, we have a lot of really large systems. We have a, 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 a medical system called Axon, which is projected to take eight years and use 22 billion kroner. And, and that's just, a, and it's now a major scandal and uh, the parliament is looking at it and there's corruption and even little Norway, which is, I guess, about the size of Lithuania has very large IT systems with very deep problems they have not solved. Okay, so I'm guessing uh, even the, the Baltic countries have, each their, at least their large national systems. And you may work as a consultant on international projects that have larger uh, systems. Okay, um, Angelo, Angelo, where are you located? What country? I'm coming from Belgium. Belgium. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> nice if people say Angelo from Belgium. <laughs> Just for fun. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, any other comments? Uh, uh, we we have uh, allocated at least a half an hour to these exercises. We have three, more five more minutes. So. I had a second exercise, but we'll take a look at it. So I'd rather have uh, questions and feedback right now. I have a question. Yes, uh, uh, and you are who? My name is Solus. I am located in Lithuania. Okay, now uh, can you help me spell your name? S-A-U. Yes. L-I-U-S. Solius, like Sol, okay. Solius, Lithuania. How do I just you wanted to ask you, uh, was it also your idea, as you, as we now talked about Goiko Ajik, in the book that we can also measure usability uh, by simply measuring the time uh, the user kind of buys some good or fulfills some task uh, with a, this application that we are building? Yeah. Uh, okay. So uh, now it probably was my ideas, I, I, uh, especially if Goiko published them, I'd have to take a look at it to say, yes, that came from me. Uh, I have published quite a lot on usability. Are you very interested in usability? No, actually, it was only interesting for me as usability was not a thing that I imagined to be measured. <laughs> it's, ah. like, it's like aesthetic for me, but Goiko Ajit, Ajik, uh, mentioned that some guy, possibly you, can measure everything, and he mentioned as example usability. So he was that's talking about. He was talking about me. Now um, uh, I put on the screen here, so it's in the permanent record that I will save. But and you can look it up. But here are some talks I held about uh, human factors, systems engineering, and usability. Uh, so if anybody is interested in usability, you can uh, do these. Uh, free downloadable slides, okay? And this goes into some detail about like 10 different ways of measuring usability. Uh, and and this, also a question, you just mentioned a big project in, in Norway which is not going well. Uh, yes. The question is, you said it's about eight years long, right? That is the estimated time before they deliver anything it is called the, uh, uh, let's see, uh, get some more space here. It's called the uh, Axon 
instead of 30. Uh, uh, A-K-S-O-N, Axon Project. And it is in the newspapers every day, big scandal, uh, Norway. But it's a, it's a very simple idea. For each person in Norway, there will be one medical journal, not many. Sounds like a very simple idea, right? But uh, uh, the estimated cost is 22 billion Norwegian kroner, and the time it's uh, eight to 10 years. Now, you know from experience that everything is two or three times more expensive than the original estimate, right? So, yeah. <laughs> Fortunately, so people have begun asking. Oh, sorry. I, I just want to say that unfortunately we do know that from experience. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, okay, so uh, this has become a major national scandal at the level of parliament and ministers and everything. There's even uh, talk of uh, corruption from uh, su the supplier PWC who got all the business and there was no proper contracting according to law. So it's a big, but the, uh, the interesting thing about these people was uh, uh, two years ago, I offered them my services for free to try to think about their project. And they said, no, we don't need it. Now they still don't realize that the reason they're having problems is they didn't use my methods as far as I'm concerned. So I'm just laughing, you know, the silly people. But, uh, but, but little Norway has such big projects and such big problems right now. In, this is an IT system. So, so actually, my, my, my question was from your experience, from, from the projects that you saw, uh, is, it like, is it like if you predict that the project will deliver something at the earliest in a year or two, it's already a failure? Isn't it from your experience? No, no, uh, no, no. Uh, again, definition of failure. Um, there, there are the the standard definitions are did not deliver the requirements. Okay. Uh, for example, they wanted ninety five percent security and got only seventy percent security. That would be failure to deliver the security value. Then the other definition of failure is they did deliver the um, positive requirements, but it costs more money, more time. And so they failed on money and time. Those are basic definitions of uh, IT project failure. Um, so you could succeed in the project, but fail in the economics or both. Again, I recommend you go to the web and just write down IT project failure and you'll find a, a 300 million papers on the subject. There's a lot of literature on it. But we have a big problem called failure, and I hope that what I'm teaching you will help you avoid the failures. Thanks. Did that answer the last question, sort of? <laughs> Not actually. Actually, my question was about uh, kind of uh, statistical data uh, for yeah. any projects that you saw in your past, in your career, for any projects which said we will deliver the system, the minimal usable product in two years. Yeah. Isn't it a sign of failure already? Like, from, from, uh, okay, as, as now I, I, yeah, I see your question. Uh, it is a failure from the point of view of Agile, which should be trying to deliver early, much earlier. That, that, that is, uh, everything may be in two years, but something very important in the short term, on the early sprints. So I am strong believer that the most important critical things should be delivered very early uh, in early sprints, okay? So uh, yeah, so if the, if the first time they deliver anything is two years, for me, that is the failure. Many people have a culture where that's it. They promise two years and uh, they actually use six years and that's how a lot of projects are. Okay, but those are called big bang waterfalls. <laughs> Big Bang Waterfall, the enemy. <laughs> yeah, thank, thanks. By the way, I'm looking at the clock a little bit. We've used an hour, right? And we could use the, a second hour on such discussion, and that might be a good idea, but I do have a lot of slides, so I 
I, I suspect that I should show more slides and lecture more. And uh, um, I, I remind you, I'm coming back on Saturday for eight hours. So you can come back and get more depth and, and maybe more discussion at that time. And you can also discuss with me by writing to my email. And if some of you want to get on and have a talk with me, that's fine too. Okay, maybe we have to move on with some kind of thing like the lecture which is promised. Is that okay? Anybody have a problem with that? Okay. So, um, but I appreciate the discussion. That's, uh, that's great. Um, now, let's see. Um, here is actually the second exercise. Uh, I'll do it rather quickly, just let you think. Um, we, we, you have, let's say you've set a goal, like we said here, um, and um, uh, I want, I, I, what I'd like you to do now is think of the most powerful way to reach the goal. Let's call it a most effective technical solution. Uh, some people would call it their uh, enterprise architecture or their architecture. Some people would call it design. <coughs> Managers would call it strategy. But it is what we call in simple English the means to the ends, the way we're going to get there. Now, if you think about, for example, let's take a security example, and somebody says, aha, we must use encryption. Okay. So encryption. Then uh, ask a very simple uh, uh, question. If we do encryption, Will it get us to 70% within a year? Yes or no? If yes, we have good enough design to get us to the first year goal, 70%. Second question, will it get us to 95% in five years? No. Aha, uh -huh. how far will it get us? It'll get us to about 72%. Okay, what does that mean? It means we have to find other architecture in addition, uh, 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 security architecture, that when we deliver it will get us to 95%. Uh, it could be, for example, real-time online monitoring of our systems by a professional security organization. Quite different from encryption, but maybe it will catch the hacker faster. So the exercise here, which I don't dare start because I fear it would use the whole hour, uh, but it's a nice exercise, is think of a technology or two for getting there and then think of a number for how far it will get us to the goal. Where along the goal will we end up? That's the exercise. And I will be showing you, if I get enough time now, uh, uh, how to uh, do this. And uh, we'll certainly uh, be doing that on Saturday in addition. So... Uh, Maybe some of you can mentally do that. You pick out a technical idea and you say, yeah, I think it will get us to our goal, or I think it will only get us halfway. And that's maybe enough. This is what I call impact estimation. You are estimating the impact or the effect of a technology on reaching your goal. And this you can only do if you have quantified the goal. So this is looking at the technology from, if you like, an architecture or a designer point of view. Enough of that. Sorry not to use an hour on that, but we'll have more time. Uh, we'll, we'll look at some of the theory of it, and uh, we'll use more time on it on Saturday. Plenty to read about it. Here, uh, okay, anybody, I, I, I pretend I'll use the next hour to lecture as well as I can to give you a feeling for these ideas. And... Uh, for those who want to go deeper, read, read the book or slides or come back on Saturday and go deeper. But uh, does anybody have a problem with me moving on with the lecture? Okay, I'll move on. Didn't hear any. <laughs> Maybe your mics are all muted and you were shouting, stop, stop, stop. All Here good. Is the, <laughs> what did you say? All good. Move on. Yeah. Okay. So here is the uh, table of contents of this lecture. And here is the table of contents of the book. 
maybe uh, because we've used the first hour for uh, uh, lecture, we only get through part of this, that's okay. At least you have the slides for the rest. And I will be handling these topics in far more depth on Saturday anyway, if you uh, attend that lecture uh, live or uh, presumably we'll have it videoed. Or you can read the book. Anyway, um, so let's see. Now, uh, every once in a while, after I've complicated things, this is very complex, lots of new ideas, I think, uh, I simplify. So here's the simplification, what I want to teach. Number one, you must quantify all of your critical stakeholder values. Every quality that your stakeholders want, if you're going to take it seriously, you're going to do anything about it, you can't leave it in nice sounding bullshit words. We need better security. We need better usability. You must absolutely quantify it for serious projects where a lot of money or prestige or life in a health system, for example, or police emergency system is at stake. So that's number one. Uh, here symbolically is the scale of measure. And here is the quantification of how good we want to be, the goal level. And here's the quantification of how bad we are, called the status level or past level. Second idea, uh, you need to have design capability, whether you call them your architects or designers, or you in fact delegate to your, uh, your, your uh, agile team to design, you must find some technology which moves you from the technology you have and this level to the technology you want. So you have to, there's a little gap here and you have to fill it with some different and better technology. Okay, this is the area we can call design, uh, as in design sprint, uh, design or architecture or something like that. This, this is requirements, this is design. Okay, now the third quantification idea is prove it's true. So that means uh, we need to um, measure that we really are maybe incrementally moving towards this goal. Maybe that we actually measure that we reached it uh, and we're done. This is uh, the famous question, when is Agile Sprint done? And my answer is it's done when you reach your goal levels. Simple idea. Hmm? It's not done when you code every, every use, use case or user story or something like that. It's done when you reach your goal level if those are the primary objectives. Um, so, uh, so that's in simplified everything I I'm, can treat today and Saturday and in the book. Uh, now we'll look at things in a little bit more detail. Here's a slide, why should we bother to quantify? And again, simplified, and here are seven different reasons uh, but, for example, it helps us discuss uh, what the customer wants, what the user wants, what the stakeholder wants. Uh, if you don't use quantified language and, and uh, they say, we want really good security, and you say, okay, we'll give you really good security, you may be talking about two different things. You may give them not what they want, but what you think they want. Now, if you agree that you're going to find 95% of the hackers, there's less opportunity to misunderstand. You say, how, how, what percentage do you want to find? And we think you want to find 95%. And they say, you're joking. We want 99.9. .9. And we, we want them found within uh, one month from now. We want that capability, not one year you're talking about. See, numbers help you um, agree, really agree, with your stakeholders and users, what you as technologists need to provide. We call that real agreement on the objectives, okay? Now, when you try out new technologies uh, and you measure how well they're doing, you get a thing called feedback. You get numbers for how well it does or how badly it does, and you get knowledge, you get facts. And you can say, this technology that the expert recommended is not working. We must find a new technology. We must find a better technology. We must implement it better, okay? 
Uh, this, is, this is agile. Agile is supposed to learn between sprints and get feedback, but unfortunately normal agile doesn't seek feedback about qualities. And we're teaching, yes, every sprint shall seek knowledge about the critical values of the stakeholders and how well our technology is working. Um, there's more here, but to save time, I'm just going to let you read that when you want. If you like seven good reasons why we should bother to uh, 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 do it. Now, what are the barriers? What are the problems? Why don't people normally quantify as well as they should? Well, lots of reasons. Leadership. If your boss said to you, you will quantify, that's how we do things around here, and if you don't want to do it, go some other place. You might quantify even if you don't like it, okay? Uh, we can call that leadership or we can call it dictatorship. <laughs> but if the, the, the boss and the people paying you said, that's the way we've decided to do it, then people would do it. <coughs> if your manager says, I don't care, bullshit is okay, and remember, that's normal, then people won't bother doing it. They'll say, why should I bother with a number? Uh, I just get extra work and extra problems. My boss isn't expecting it. So we need leaders. Uh, and many of my clients, we have a leader like the, the CEO, the top manager says, you will quantify. Otherwise, I don't know what I'm paying you for. I don't know why I'm funding your project. You will quantify or you actually don't have a job here anymore. Then it gets serious. Motivation. Now, ideally, we wouldn't need a boss to tell us what to do. We are professionals. We are uh, systems engineers, software engineers. We are uh, motivated to do things properly. And that means we quantify qualities like all professionals, medical or engineering, and that's it. But we are, uh, IT people are not motivated like that, with few exceptions, some of them listening in, I'm sure. Another problem is education. We are not educated at our schools, our universities, to quantify qualities. We're, we are educated to quantify some qualities like profit or availability, but we're not trained to quantify anything, and we're not trained to quantify things like security and usability, and those are the things we need. So our educational systems hasn't given us the uh, how to quantify anything and everything that we need to do. Now, if you're not educated in the formal education system, there's something called training. Well, we go on lots of agile training courses, but we do not learn how to quantify quality. So the training has fallen down. You are now getting training on how to quantify. Uh, we don't know about the methods. Uh, we, 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 you know, how many people have read one of my books before? And, and gather the knowledge of the methods that way. I mean, the books have been there for decades. Lots of people have, but most people have not. Um, what, if, uh, what if it was the law that you have to quantify security in your system or it is an illegal system? Let's say it's a government system and you, you're allowed to not quantify the quality. What if the law says important critical things for survival of the medical system for is that you must quantify the security you're delivering. Otherwise, you're not allowed to operate the system. So uh, we don't have those legal drivers that say you must do it properly. Insurance. Uh, we will not insure the system against failure uh, if you don't do things properly. And uh, insurance, uh, for example, when you uh, want to buy insurance for driving in your car, there are certain... Uh, requirements for the quality of the car and the quality of the driver so that that insurance is valid, okay? So one day we might insure our IT projects and the insurance companies will say, we will not insure unless you do it properly. And then there's politics. And I'll let that float around for a while, okay? Now, uh, here, uh, a lot of, it's amazing how many people tell me, Tom, that cannot be quantified or it's soft. As late as last night, I was talking to a professional friend of mine, and he used the word soft for these things. And he's a very knowledgeable book writing professional. Uh, he and I have agreed we're going to, I'm going to teach him how to uh, quantify 
uh, his requirements for his business, like later today. <laughs> now, here's, here's the simplest trick of all. If you want to know how to quantify anything, including the thing you did in your exercise today, if you write that word you were thinking of earlier today in a browser, and you can do this while I'm talking now, uh, let's say you take in privacy, and you write the word metrics after it. Look what I get, 331 million hits. Or more importantly, look what I get. The very first few hits are probably pretty good advice on how to quantify privacy. Or pri the British would say our privacy, as Americans would say, right? So my simple tip for you who want to learn how other people have quantified, how they found scales of measure. This is quite simply Google it. It couldn't be simpler. It turns out everything you ever wanted to do is probably already done. You can guess how many people in the world are interested in security, for example, or technical debt, for example. And if you don't know how to quantify it, look it up. There are probably thousands of people who have free good advice for you. So stop saying it can't be done. If you look it up and you find no answers, then maybe you're right. But that will never happen. Okay. Uh, when you can quantify values, what can you do with it? Well, I, I have a time problem, so if I, I can't go through every one of these, but let's just say here's a very long list of things you can do uh, if you can quantify, and these are all things within IT development, right? So everything can be done better. You can write a contract for delivery of those values. You can do quality control with relation to those values. You can do objectives for major projects. You can do the architecture better. I just wrote a book called, which is free download, uh, uh, called uh, Systems Enterprise Architecture. See, look, look it up on my Twitter or website, get a free copy, okay? I think I added it to the references last night in, in, the, in this, for instance, architecture. So everything in IT can be done better if you have quantified the critical objectives uh, with scales of measure. So here we have, go back to simple, right? Uh, the simple idea is quantifying clarifies. That's it, makes everything clearer, everything better. Here is our simple idea of a value scale. Here's an idea of a strategy that maybe only goes 50% of the way towards our goal. Uh, so we're interested in two major forms of quantification. What is the value we require and how good are our technical strategies? And if they're not good enough, we need to add something so we can get to our goal. That's it. That's the whole lecture. That's the whole rest of the day. Now, I showed you already in my example uh, what I called um, uh, um, uh, scale parameters. I'm going to show you uh, a lecture on them. Now, this is from my book, Sustainability Planning, which is the United Nations goals. And uh, if you're interested in charity and saving the world and poverty, you might be interested in this book. My basic criticism is the United Nations has its heart in the right place. And quite a lot of people uh, are with them there. <coughs> Half of all Norwegian government ministers go around with a badge on their lapel, which is this badge. Quite a lot of corporations have decided they're going to subscribe to the sustainability planning as part of their corporate effort. So it's very popular, but it's long story short, as I document in this book, it is bullshit. It is nice sounding words that politicians and United Nations politicians say, but it is not clear exactly how much hunger of which type they wish to reduce and things like that or poverty. So I show in detail how to make these more quantified. So here's one example. There's a poverty goal, end poverty, uh, and there's a subset of it, uh, goal 1.5. And here is the scale of measure that I uh, 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 said, the percent of success and, and uh, in building resilience 
uh, for uh, vulnerable people in certain situations who are subjected to certain shocks. Now you can see that these are general ideas that there are different kinds of building things, different kinds of resilience, different kinds of vulnerability, different situations and different shocks. I'll show you more detail in a moment. So I have written a very advanced kind of scale with five scale parameters. Now this is a very big system. This is the world, or this is the world of poverty, which is half of the world, okay? And uh, uh, there are, uh, this is not a small trivial uh, five guys program this in three weeks kind of system. This is a uh, 15 to 50 year project for changing the world. Um, uh, one idea uh, I'm teaching here is if we do our scales properly, we can reuse them many times for many different purposes. So there's a, an idea of reuse of scales. We'll get back to that other example in about a scale or two. Here's another example. Uh, this is uh, uh, from a, a, a British example, uh, a scale for social inclusion. The numbers of people who moved out of poverty uh, from a borough. And so we define people as employed and unemployed cases. We could have many more. We define sure. poverty as on the street, food support, credit card debt, below average income, and more. And the borough, we have uh, Camden, Westminster, and Wandsworth boroughs in London. And I'm, I, what I'm showing you is these, uh, this scale is general, but it's not fuzzy and unclear. Okay, somebody turned on their microphone and probably didn't intend to. Okay, yeah, gone. Okay, yeah. So I'm showing you a very simple example of writing a scale with uh, scale parameters so we can model the situation in London of poverty. And what do we do with these? Well, we define borough as these boroughs and people as these classes of people. We call these conditions, okay? And now we can, uh, basically what we're doing is we're modeling the who, what, where, when, and why, the conditions. And this enables us to model complex systems like 10 million people in London system or something like that. Here is a status or the past uh, on a scale of measure. There are lots of other things defined on the scale, but uh, uh, the status is 12 for all people and people on the streets, food support below average income in Camden. In September 2017, the answer is 12, and the source is Jennifer Thomas and Jane Batui. Okay, now that is what I call a clear, a clear idea of systems analysis of exactly what does 12 mean, what is our status. And for each one of these, there are three statuses, three wishes, one goal, each one of these has a similar set. So uh, we know exactly what the number means on the scale because it's defined by uh, these different parameters. So what I'm trying to get your mind in gear about is a very advanced idea. To my knowledge, you will not find this in OKR or anywhere else. The idea of scale parameters as a way of modeling uh, systems. Now, um, slide with a lot of text and <coughs> little time, half an hour left. Uh, where do we get scales of measure? Well, number one, I've got a list for you of nine different places and details. And, and uh, we, uh, so uh, you're going to have to, re and when you're asking yourself, where do I find my scale? Maybe you'll get back to this slide 1.1 and you take a look and see, can I do it there? Can I find it there? Can I find it there? This gives you a practical checklist of where do I find a scale of measure. I showed you a very simple one, Google it, find your scales there, okay? Now, another way of finding scales, and here, here are some of these scale parameters, and here are the conditions, these are real. And uh, how do you find these conditions? Well, a uh, very simple method is you walk out on the street and you start observing scenarios and suppliers and, and consumers and you see, aha, there's a truck and it says emergency vehicle. So obviously emergency vehicle maybe has to be in my list here somewhere. In other words, observing reality 
is a very good way of finding out what should be on your scale, is my simple idea. This is systems analysis, which moves from systems analysis over to requirements uh, definition. <clears throat> now, here's a little gift to you. Uh, here's my uh, 2005 book, Defining My uh, Planning Language, uh, Plangwage, uh, Competitive Engineering. And if you want to pay my publisher 45 euros, you can buy it. But if you want a free digital copy, you'll get a link to it in these slides. Chapter five in Competitive Engineering has things like this. It has examples of for example, usability, security, and other things. And it includes examples of scales of measure for entry condition scale, example of scales of measure for training requirements, examples of scales of measure for computer familiarity, with uh, examples of types of scale parameters you can use. So here, in other words, uh, what I have is uh, 10 or 20 years of experience of doing usability um, uh, quantification. And so I collected the ideas and then I wrote down examples of scales of measure. <clears throat> so in other words, look it up in the book becomes one method of finding scales of measure. And I give you my book and chapter five for free. Here is the uh, free book, competitive engineering. So you can use that to get it later. Here is uh, page 156. And here is a measure of maintainability. Now, let me give you a hint. This is approximately the same as technical debt. In other words, maintaining the system afterwards. But it is also any kind of fixing bugs and problems and enhancing the systems. And there's an incredible idea here, which I picked up from a, um, a, an engineering textbook called Reliability Handbook, published 1966. And that is maintainability is not the simple mean time between uh, mean time to repair that engineers learn it is in fact a whole set of ideas uh, including a whole lot of testing ideas after you've made the change and recovery ideas fixing things up after you fix the system and all of these are measurable and all of these can be stated in advance all of these you can design towards to make them better and all of these you can measure you got. So this is a way, if you're mature enough to fight technical debt when you're building your grand new system, instead of experiencing bad technical debt 10 years from now, this is how you're going to do it. And this is a great pattern, is another popular word. This is a pattern for how to do it in practice, borrowed from our friends, the engineers. But in fact, we can do this on software databases and everything else. Again, in the book, in the slides, how to deal with technical debt or maintainability. From the same competitive engineering book, here are, uh, here's a, uh, a diagram of all the different types of things for which I have listed uh, scales of measure that you can copy and modify. So there's your map. So here is the usability stuff. Uh, here is adaptability, extendability, portability. Here's the security stuff. Here's the availability, reliability, maintainability of the system. So uh, I've been using, published most of this in my software metrics book, 1976. Uh, although uh, the usability was not on the agenda there. So it uh, came a few, a decade or two later in the, in the 70s and 80s. Okay, so uh, that's a simple place to get a hold of and read about and, uh, you know, you forget everything else, forget the internet, forget thinking about it yourself, just copy my basic ideas from the book, gives you a good flying start based on decades of experience. Um, okay, now, uh, next idea is, as you already saw here, usability is an umbrella title for a set of things which we call usability. Uh, availability is an umbrella title for a set of things, reliability, maintainability, integrity, okay? Quality is an umbrella title for all of these things. 
performance characteristics covers quality, resource savings, and workload capacity. Okay. So there's this concept that there are some words which we use, which are not, do not have a scale of measure. They have a set of things which have scales of measure. So here are, uh, uh, the, the, this is from my uh, new book this summer, Ken, which is free. Uh, you'll find it in the references at the end, free download. But the World Economic Forum is looking at something called 21st century skills. And I, I discovered that they had not quantified what those skills were. <clears throat> but here they were, character qualities, competencies, and foundational literacies. And then they also listed that the, the character qualities were the adaptability, the curiosity, the initiative, the leadership. These are what I call values. These are also qualities of people. Okay, these are competence qualities. These are uh, basic literacy qualities. Okay, but uh, you can, this little arrow means you can quantify. You can make this idea clearer. You can decide exactly what you want in your organization, not what the World Economic Forum decides for the world, but what you want in Lithuania for character qualities, competencies, and foundational literacies. And you're going to have to quantify and you're going to have to have scale parameters to define what you want in Lithuania. Okay. So, uh, but what I'm using this slide for is just a simple idea that often we say, I can't quantify character qualities, but you know what? The moment you decompose this idea as it is very common into a set of ideas, you'll find that suddenly it's a little bit easier to quantify adaptability and curiosity and initiative. And if it isn't, maybe you need to decompose curiosity using scale parameters, different kinds of curiosity, right? Curiosity killed the cat. Satisfaction brought it back, old say. Uh, maybe sometimes you decompose. It's an old engineering technique. Decompose ideas that you'd like to quantify until quantification becomes obvious. Now this quantification, I have, this uh, decomposition, I have another name for, Cartesian decomposition, named after Rene Descartes, who pointed out dec hundreds of years ago that if you want to master and understand a complex problem, you will decompose it and understand the constituent parts. And then you can synthesize or uh, go up to higher levels and understand the whole. Okay, so this is Cartesian synth decomposition, and then this is going this direction is Cartesian uh, um, uh, synthesis. So an old scientific method, basic science of in, uh, analyzing the world. Uh, scales of measure, well, I showed you already Googling. So here are just two examples of what you get, but the answer is, you get good stuff by Googling it, plenty, uh, plenty of food for thought. You will normally have to pick and choose what you want and modify it, but you can't say there's no way to do it. That's the most important thing about uh, Googling it, okay? Okay, now, uh, here's an example of ambition level. Remember, we did an example on it. And I've learned something. When you write down an ambition level, which is usually what your client says to you, or you'll find it in their early plans, uh, it turns out if you analyze it, uh, you will find the information you need so you can structure your scale with the scales of measure. So here is an area that says schools, teachers. Uh, so I can you get your phone? schools, teachers, and learning communities. And I read that and I thought that is stakeholders. So now I have stakeholders. And there's something about balanced right of self-government autonomy. Well, those are called rights and there may be many different kinds of rights. And there's something here motivating and, and uh, uh, engaging all the actors. <coughs> I thought that I'll call <coughs> educational activities. So in other words, from the and the source of this is in fact the European Union text. I'm reading the European Union, bullshit, nice sounding bullshit, and I'm using it to structure a scale. And that's what I want to teach you. 
you, the bullshit is not just bullshit, throw it away. It actually has a hidden structure which you can use to make it clearer, to make it quantified, and to give it this kind of structure. Here is a little map. Uh, on the map on this side, we have these little arrows, and they mean these are various uh, um, uh, uh, objectives. By the way, this is planning in Oslo in March for COVID-19 survival from Norway. So these things have to do with how Norway is going to handle uh, it. And these are the stakeholders. In other words, people involved with COVID. And uh, at some point in our planning, we said, well, uh, uh, you know, uh, for example, uh, the workplace is uh, interested in the attribute substitute drivers. And then now it gets a bit difficult here. Uh, what, we're, what we're seeing is because we digitally for each one of these know exactly who the stakeholders are, uh, we can say, draw me a map. I can see the connection between all stakeholders I can see that this stakeholder has about four different attributes. And if I were good at following the lines, I'd say that, okay, research institution is interested in collecting information, uh, how good it is to collect information on people who were sick or died or something like that. Um, now, the, the point of uh, th this is the following. There are very many stakeholders in any large system. We're talking 50 to 500 different types of stakeholder. And one stakeholder can have one million people behind it, like potentially sick people in a country. Um, and then, uh, uh, but the definition of stakeholder is they have value requirements. Okay. So here, here's the stakeholder called university, and there's no connection to any of the value requirements. That means either that the university is not a stakeholder, <clears throat> or we didn't note somewhere which requirements they're interested in or that they have a requirement that's not here. So this is a way of doing systems <coughs> analysis. This map is sort of a rat's nest of complexity, but now we can say, wait a minute, here is a requirement, uh, you know, equ equipment, uh, 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 I can't read it because my picture is over it, but here's a requirement that no stakeholder has. So is it a real requirement or do we not know who the stakeholder is or have we not connected them? Connecting a stakeholder to a requirement means you can ask, how much do you want and when do you want it? And if you can't connect any stakeholder to a requirement, well, the, the programmers shouldn't be guessing what people want in a health system. That's a dangerous act that will kill people in your country. Okay, now this is done by a digital tool called Valplan. <clears throat> Uh, and uh, you can use any tool you like, but you should be able to connect all stakeholders to, to all value requirements, one way or another, uh, even if you have to draw it manually, but it's nice to have a digital tool to do the job. Okay. Uh, now, here's another example. Here's a scale. Uh, with uh, different um, uh, scale parameters. And then here is a wish level. Now, wish is what the stakeholder dreams about, but it's not necessarily an approved goal, committed goal for the project. That's called a goal. But anyway, they want 10 minutes for the current council tenant in a council flat to uh, fill out a uh, form. Uh, and that's to be delivered by the end of 2018 in this case. So this was planned uh, for London housing. Okay, what I'm showing is how you write a uh, requirement uh, based on the scale. And but here we are. Uh, here is the uh, 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 ambition level, the blah blah blah, which leads directly to the scale, which leads directly to a very specific and clear wish. Here's another map where we've taken just one requirement and we've mapped all the stakeholders that we know about that are related to it, okay? And now it's, it's very, we're not bothered with all the other requirements and all the other stakeholders. Now, what can you do 
if you know that autonomy is a requirement held by these stakeholders? And the answer is you have a little special committee for the educational autonomy requirement. And you should find real people <coughs> representing the educational authorities and the legal guidelines and the central authorities and the individual teachers, get a real teacher. And you can say to them, how much educational autonomy do you want? What type of educational autonomy do you want? Uh, when do you want it? In other words, you use them to do systems analysis of what is our requirement. And uh, so this is a more advanced notion of how to do systems analysis. You map your stakeholders, you identify um, uh, values that they have, and then you go back to them and do deeper analysis. And maybe you do analysis not just once, that's a big bang waterfall, but on a continuous long-term basis when things change and people get systems and get different ideas. And you update the requirement uh, based on feedback, okay? So this is being agile with regard to your stakeholders and your requirements. Okay, so scale ideas, get them from <coughs> reality. Uh. Now, this subject, where do we get the scales of measure from? Uh, here's another list, which is too long to go through, but maybe good to have a list to say, this is a tool I can use when I'm looking for it. I go back to slide 38, 1.1, 1 .1, and here are ways of uh, finding them. By the way, here's a little map I'd like to introduce you. This is, this is our sprint cycle, okay? The Gilb cycle, the Evo cycle for Evo is, is our, our uh, Evo steps is our sprint name. And we start with stakeholders and say, who are our stakeholders? These are people who have requirements for us, quite simply, people and things like laws. Then they tell us what their values are and we write them down and we quantify them. Now we've got requirements. Then we go to the architect or designer and we get solutions. Then we take big solutions, which might take three years to implement and decompose them into sprints. We're now agile. We're looking for smaller sprints. Uh, then we uh, develop the uh, uh, smaller, uh, call them uh, sub-architecture, sub-solutions. And then we deliver them on a sprint into a real live system. Then we measure how much of the value we thought we'd get, did we really get? Then we learn, yes, we did it, it works. Or no, this solution is terrible. It doesn't give us what we need. We need to go back and find better solutions immediately. Otherwise, stakeholders will be dying, literally, in the COVID crisis. Okay? And uh, then we go back to the stakeholders and said, we gave you some new system. And uh, we measured what happened, but <clears throat> maybe you reacted to the system and said, that was great, we're so happy, do more. Or maybe you said, we didn't even notice you did anything that impacted us. Why are you wasting our time? Okay, so that's learning from stakeholders. Anyway, so this is our advanced agile, as it should be, cycle, based on quantification of the values and quantification uh, of the uh, architecture or and learning from the quantification. So this is your new agile cycle. Um, so the, by the way, the, uh, the, the stakeholder ideas here is, is uh, uh, worth, I, I, I could do, I have done the whole one day course just on stakeholders, but it's a big subject, but I'll, I'll simplify everything. Stakeholders are many, they are tricky. They will tell you false things, fake news. They don't know what they're talking about. They are confusing. They're in conflict. And uh, so, but you still have to do what they want. This is the definition of successful systems is successful for the stakeholders that count, that are funding us, that determine our legal requirements. So we have to listen, not necessarily to all stakeholders about everything, but we certainly have to listen to some stakeholders about some critical things. And it's a difficult discipline, and it's not for programmers. 
It's not for agile people. It's for business analysts, frankly, and they need to up their game in listening to stakeholders. By the way, notice I'm not saying users and customers here. I'm saying, forget that. That's too narrow. That's for simpler systems. We need to talk about stakeholder cases, uh, stakeholder stories. We need to be looking at far broader ideas than just customers and users. So another example, uh, but uh, we have enough examples and too little time. In fact, only uh, 10 minutes. So I think what I need to do is ask myself how I'm best going to use the next uh, 10 minutes. And I think what I'm going to do is skip through the detail, which I will do more of this detail on Saturday. So I don't feel too bad about it. And I want to get to a uh, show you a little preview of the um, how we use these ideas. Uh, but all, all of this is, I've said something about all of this. Now, uh, the second half is very simple. And I, I could say if I just got through this slide, that would be great. So let me introduce you to the second half of the lecture of how do we quantify designs, strategies, architectures? That's the question, okay? Now on this axis, I have a thing called an impact estimation table. IET, Impact Estimation Table, okay? And half of all my slides are about this, but obviously I won't get through very much of them right now, but who cares? I'm gonna put this idea in front of you, and if you say, I love that idea, it will help me manage my project, and I want to learn more, well, read the book, come back on Saturday, uh, try to do it, okay? That was the second exercise, try to do it. But let me try to explain the table to you. On this axis, we have, you see the little yellow arrow? We have the value requirements. Here are four value requirements. Stay healthy, okay? This is the Coronavirus Management Norway project, okay? And uh, on this axis, we also have, not the values, but we have the costs, and these can be any cost you like. In this case, cost of implementation, uh, in um, uh, days and capital cost in kroner. But we could even have things like technical debt cost every year in five years. But these are <clears throat> all the uh, cost ideas. <clears throat> now, what is this? On this axis, we have a little light bulb. And light bulb is our symbol for bright idea, also known as design or architecture or strategy or the means these ideas are the means for satisfying our COVID goals or objectives, okay? So we're gonna, and this is what we program and code and deliver. We don't program and code this stuff. We program and code this stuff, okay? Uh, the design. So, uh, so the question is, these four ideas, are they good enough to get us to our goal, number one? If so, we have a complete set of architecture. And number two, uh, uh, are there any of these that are better than the others and we should do them first? In other words, early uh, sprints, early Evo value delivery steps, as I call it. Now, here is, uh, so health architecture, these are just tags. The definition in detail could be several pages of the strategy is elsewhere. If we click on this in the tool, we get access to all the detail of this and this. Uh, but this is overview without a lot of detail. Anyway, it says here that health architecture is rated to um, the 13% uh, of our goal or five, uh, uh, five steps, uh, moving from 50 to 55, five steps on this scale of measure. Uh, so what does that mean? Well, it means it does a little bit of good. It does 13% of all the good we want to do, but uh, it doesn't, certainly doesn't solve our problem. Transport architecture is rated to uh, cover 50% of all we want to do. Well, that's much better. So if I had a choice between doing, doing this and this, I should maybe do this to get something done. Wait a minute. Tour de, that's actually the name of a person who suggested the architecture. Uh, 
gratuitous architecture covers 63%. Well, that's better than 50%. And the workplace architecture covers 75%. Wow, why bother with these guys? This, this gang has architecture that gets me, with one architecture, gets me 70% of the way to the goal. That I would then, uh, five minutes to the end, I would, I would uh, so now I can prioritize and said, you know, I should do this first. And if it's uh, too big to do in a sprint, I should decompose it and maybe do it in smaller sprints, but I'll do that. Okay, so long story short, an impact estimation table is asking how good numerically, quantitatively, are my ideas for satisfying my goals. Notice this little question mark. This means nobody has said how good it is. Nobody knows. And the answer could be very, very good, and it could be very, very bad, and it's a known unknown. This table forces us to think about all architectures for all critical goals simultaneously. It allows us to think in multiple dimensions at the same time. It also allows us to look at the costs. So for example, uh, we, can, we have computed here the value to cost ratio. And this fellow here didn't look so good, but it's dirt cheap. So actually it's twice as good value for money, 40, compared to this fellow who was very, very good, but relatively expensive, okay? So here's a way of looking at the value for money. <coughs> and more advanced, we actually look at the quality of these estimates uh, whether they're just wild guesses or very solid knowledge. And we can choose a winner, which turns out to be this one, which is based on more solid knowledge. And it's, uh, 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 it is, for example, three times better than this one based on solid knowledge. Uh, here, by the way, we sum up the um, degree to which uh, these ideas, if we did them all, would satisfy our goal. And it says here 200%, which is twice as much as we need. So doing all of these will probably get us to our goal. And uh, these will actually all theoretically get us to our goal, but they won't give us a safety factor of two. This one did. In other words, they're not twice as good as we think they should be. So this is an engineering tactic, uh, putting in a safety factor. In my Tesla, it says, what is your safety factor behind the other cars? One car to seven cars. I like high safety factors, so I always dial into seven cars distance behind the car in front of me. And so this is two cars behind safety factor. And good engineering practice is to design so that when these go wrong and Murphy's Law hits you, you will probably succeed anyway. Now, that was very quick, and I'll go into more detail on it on Saturday. You can read about it using these slides, but this is a way of quantifying the values and costs and riskiness or uncertainties of all technology that you're going to code and program uh, on all critical values for the government from COVID and all the costs. The most important cost for COVID was always how fast can we implement it before the COVID hits too many people. So uh, now that gives me two minutes uh, left, which uh, and, and uh, lots of uh, stuff there, but we don't have time for it. Uh, but I want to move towards the uh, end of the uh, uh, course. So here is a reminder of the Saturday workshop and sign up for it. And I'll have eight hours if you can stand it. But that's more time to go through these uh, same things in detail. But I'll be talking about agile tools. Uh, and for example, I'll go into much more detail about stakeholders and stuff like that. Uh, here uh, at the end, we have references. <clears throat> Here's a friend of mine who's known me for 25 years and just got a new job uh, uh, by referencing the fact that he used my methods uh, in the middle of COVID with very hot competition for the job. So these methods will get you a job in case you didn't know. Here are some books I wrote with free downloads for the most part. Here are some more books, free downloads for the most part. Here are some papers I wrote, free downloads for the most part, and some free slides and some free videos and some uh, uh, bad plans for national health 
and some other references. So there's plenty to study for those who can read and uh, read the current slides and come back on Saturday. Uh, uh, here are the, the, the raw slides. I already have a raw version of the slides for Saturday. So I end on time exactly now because I did a thing called design to cost that I'll talk about. Uh, and uh, we could say the, the two hour lecture is ended. We could also uh, say you can go, but if anybody has any questions, I'm willing to uh, take some questions and discussion at the end. Thank you very much. Okay, that's uh, huge, I think, uh, from my perspective. So thank you, Tom. Uh, maybe I wasn't so so into and, and interested in what you uh, developed. Now I'm even more interested. I'm looking forward to read more. <laughs> yeah, it, it that, wasn't. That, that's uh, what a short lecture can do. A short lecture can get people interested. Hmm. But you know, normally I do one day training on uh, just a, a loan on the value requirements and one day training on the. Uh, impact estimation table. I said one day training. So we're, uh, it's, very, it's, it's not long enough to teach you how to do it, but it's long enough to get you interested. And that's the important thing. Yeah. So I guess uh, on Saturday we can um, step, uh, get a couple more steps into uh, and more like uh, increase the interest of uh, what you developed. And I think in the future, maybe we will uh, meet you in another workshops uh, yeah. to learn even more. <laughs> Good. So tell, you can, uh, if you think uh, it might be interesting for some, from some friends of yours, tell them about this coming workshop. And of course, the slides we use today are available for everybody everywhere. And there will be a video uh, shortly. How, how fast are you going to get the video up? Yeah, I think uh, uh, our or something, uh, they uh, Zoom is generating, so we'll put after, we'll get the link. And uh, I think also uh, to we'll share your uh, links, what you shared now. So everyone could, you know, in advance uh, look on that material. But by the way, one of my best professional friends who's building incredible world beating uh, uh, tools, uh, he said, I have read your competitive engineering book nine times. So let's just say, uh, if you didn't get everything I said on the first round of two hours video, you can repeat the video as many times as you need. <laughs> That's good. Okay, guys, uh, do you have any question? Because we, ha we have that ability still. Well, you have mentioned the impediments uh, to the uh, um, using all these techniques, right? So yeah. uh, I've missed one, but maybe uh, you can elaborate on it. Uh, it, it is called, uh, you name it, we game it. You know the drill, right? So yeah, you name it, we game it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you're right. And so any quantified method, uh, people will game it. That is, they will try to cheat for their benefit <clears throat> if they're unethical. Uh, so now let me give you the short answer. I have a great deal uh, of methods for counteracting gaming. Um, for example, the source I already talked about. By identifying who said it, you can, uh, it's one of the tactics for getting back to the source and saying, you said this, are you still agree? Is it still true? That's one little tactic of 100 tactics for preventing people from gaming the system. Uh, uh, I have a whole book called Software Inspection, 500 pages. How do you do quality control on this? This prevents gaming the system. And I will talk about quality control and quality assurance on Saturday. Okay? So long story short, I have actually hundreds of pages of slides and papers on uh, quality control and other methods of preventing gaming. Does that... Gaming is human, gaming is inevitable, but uh, you, there are ways of defeating the gaming. Okay. Have we any other questions? Guys? Good question. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. I 
I see there are no questions more. Okay. Okay. So, okay. Thank you once more, Tom. Uh, for well, thank you for hosting me and making it available internationally and free. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So that's it for today. Uh, thank you, everyone. Have a good uh, rest of your day and see you on Saturday. See you Saturday. Bye-bye now. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank bye. you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you.